hear arguments on this morning is Medina Hospital and Automation Tool and Die, Inc. And that is case number for the record, uh, 18 CA 0009L. Both parties will have 15 minutes to present their arguments to the court and the appellant uh, automation tool may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you are going to reserve time, let me know and I'll keep you track of keep track of how much time you have left. The arguments are uh, being recorded and represented on the YouTube channel that the court has, so please keep your voice up and remain at the podium. Um, also, we have the issue of the court's 54B certification as well, so feel free to address that issue as the final appealable order. Okay, we've read the briefs and we're ready to proceed if you are. Yes, sir. Three minutes. Three minutes. All right, you may proceed. May it please the court, uh, my name is Thomas Murata. I'm representing Automation Tool and Die, Inc. in this matter. Um, and the issue here, of course, is whether or not um, Ohio Administrative Code 1423-6-28 provides a private right of action in favor of state-funded employers like Automation Tool and Die. And this is, of course, the appeal arises from a the trial court's order granting the defendant's 12C motion for partial summary judgment on that issue. Um, 1423-620A imposes an obligation under the Bureau of Workers' Compensation's Health Partnership Program to provide accurate information to the, to the Bureau, the Commission, the claimant, employers, or their representatives. And, and prohibits documentation that contains false, fraudulent, deceptive, or misleading information. Um, the facts here are, are, are fairly simple. Automation is a, a company here in Medina County. Um, in 2008, uh, an employee there was injured in an alleged industrial accident. He sought straight treatment at uh, Medina General Hospital's on the clock care. It's an occupational medical clinic. Uh, he was seen initially four dates by a, um, a nurse practitioner, Jamie Kirby. Uh, Ms. Kirby signed the first report of injury um, and later used a facsimile stamp of Dr. Francine Terry's signature to request uh, MRIs, which uh, were rec recommended uh, as a matter of hospital protocol. She used this on a BWC form C9 requesting additional treatment or additional conditions. Um, Mr. Browning saw her several times um, into, I believe, October. Um, when she gets the MRI results back, there's some her herniated discs and some other degenerative changes. She, using, again, using Dr. Terry's facsimile signature, stamps another C9. Uh, requesting the additional allowance and certifying that the physician has found that the, the injury is causally related to the industrial incident. Um, this is on a pre-printed Medina General Hospital form where the box indicating causation is checked in blank. Um, at, at no time prior to that did Dr. Terry ever see the file, see the patient, or have much to do with this other than being a supervising or collaborating physician for the, the CNP. Um, Dr. Terry, in fact, later admits she has no role in the preparation of, of the C9. She never reviewed the C9 and never made any medical determination of, on its content. Uh, in fact, she was not even aware the C9 had ever been issued. The, uh, the additional allowances were granted on November 21st of 2008. In 2009, early spring of 2009, Mr. Browning leaves the employee of Automation Tool and Die. Um, Automation Tool and Die did not appeal the allowance, relying instead on Dr. Terry's apparent medical judgment in the C9. Um, later on, they learned that Mr. Browning um, was, in fact, doing construction work while at the time he was receiving uh, temporary total benefits for, for the injury. Uh, they got involved, hired a private investigator, discovered he was working construction. Um, 
basically doing uh, a house in Cleveland, um, jumping off of porches, swinging power tools over his head, and in general behaving like Spider-Man. And uh, they then notified the BWC, who said they're a special investigation unit uh, out to, to investigate. They interviewed Dr. Terry and took a position statement in which she stated, admitted that the C9 requesting the condition was in fact signed by uh, nurse Kirby. And she then said she could not definitively say that the bulging discs were solely directly related to the injury, but were rather requested as a matter of standard protocol of the, of the clinic. Um, ATD brought a uh, motion to, to, to invoke continuing jurisdiction. The uh, Industrial Commission found that, the, that fraud had been committed based on the representations of Mr. Browning and the uh, inaccurate and misleading C9 rubber stamp by the nurse. Um, that's where we, we came today. ATD filed a, a suit in, in common pleas here. And um, as you know, the, the motion for partial summary judgment was filed alleging that there was no private right of action based on the regulations cited. It's the automation's position that, in fact, there is a private right of action here and that the Strack versus Westfield Company's case, which is um, this court adopts the uh, court versus Ash test, um, supports the conclusion that, in fact, there is private right of action in the trial of the court was an error. Uh, Strack provides three prongs for this analysis. The first one is, are the plaintiffs in the class for whose special, special benefit the statute or regulation was enacted? <clears throat> and I think that, that's fairly clear from the language of 1423.620A, which specifically identifies employers or their representatives as among the persons to whom providers are prohibited from providing false, fraudulent, deceptive, or misleading information. Um, the trial court correctly identifies automation tool and die as an employer under the regulation and defendants as providers under the, the health care partnership program. But it errs in finding that um, they are not a member of the class of persons for whom the regulation was enacted because in doing so, they refer to another um, rule under Section 41236, 41236.01.1. And that section says, unless specifically stated otherwise, the rules of this chapter governing the payment of medical services and supplies shall apply to payments health to health care providers in all claims for industrial injuries or occupational diseases before the Bureau self-insuring employers, uh, MCOs, and so on. Um, the trial court's reasoning seems to be that section 01.1 um, speaks only to self-insuring employ employers. Automation tool and die is a state-funded employer. Um, but if, again, as the language of the statute of the reg says, it's for rules of the chapter governing payment. You look at the table of contents of, of OAC 41236, the rules under there talk about a whole lot of things. There's many rules governing payment. There are also rules governing standards for diagnosis, um, a, a variety of other issues. So number one, the, the trial court erred in applying the wrong regulation to the analysis. Um, it is, in fact, 4123.620A, which applies, and that only talks of employers generally. Um, so the, the purpose of the, of the reg cited by the trial court is to look at issues of payment and include self-insuring employers, I think for the obvious reason that the self-insurer stands in the shoes of the Bureau and makes the payments itself. But there are other things going on in that chapter of, of the OAC that apply to all employers generally, and that's to whom 4123.620 applies. Well, counsel, the court, though, said, assuming arguendo, that, that the employer is an intended beneficiary or, you know, uh, would be included under the statute, it still wasn't going to meet the, 
the requirements under the, the uh, test that you um, indicated, and that's strep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right, and then it goes on to look at the second prong of, of strep. Um, and its analysis there is faulty. In fact, um, as I understand it, what the trial court says is, well, first of all, Strack requires there has to be evidence of legislative intent, explicit or implicit, to create or, or deny a private cause of action. But the trial court notes there is no explicit intent to deny a private cause of action, and goes on to infer such denial based upon the lack of an express grant of a private right of action. Um, it states that if the legislator wanted a private right of action, it could have said so, or, or the agency could have promulgated a rule that said so. Um, but that analysis ignores the possibility under STRAP that there can be an implied private right of action. Uh, and if I understand the analysis correctly, it's they say because there's no explicit right of action, we can infer a implied denial. That there's no consideration of whether there's an implied grant. Um, the rule itself explicitly states that the providers are some obliged to submit accurate documentation, and they're obliged to submit it to this class of, of, of entity or person. Um, in addition, the appellees and the trial court, I believe, argue that the sole remedy for the breach of 20A is decertification under uh, 4123, uh, 602.7 and, and 17. Uh, in fact, those statutes provide only provide a remedy for the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. So if the Bureau of Workers' Compensation uh, receives or becomes aware of false or misleading information, it can decertify the provider from participating in the health uh, partnership program. Is it, isn't one of the factors um, that the courts look at in regard to these type of cases where there's a private cause of action by statute? Uh, is whether or not the uh, person impacted by the statute, this person has standing that may be impacted by the statute, um, as to whether or not they can be made whole in some other fashion or form? Um, I, be I believe, I, I don't know the answer to that okay, question, to be honest, but in this case, there is a, there is a mechanism that partially handles that when the continuing jurisdiction was was exercised and the uh, conditions were removed from the employer's experience there was a credit of the overpaid premium attributable to this however because the employer incurred other expenses which included um, hiring private detectives legal fees lost time turning this down um, and, and, and proving the fraud that the, the Bureau had, however, for whatever reason, missed, uh, it had damages that are not covered by um, the refund of premium. But isn't that why you have the second cause of action? Um, well, that's part of it. That's certainly part of it. But the second cause of action, the fraud claim, is different uh, in terms of what must be proved, the facts that must be proved, and, and in fact, in the, the legal theories. Um, if you look at the, the, the rule we're talking about here, there's nothing in the way of, uh, of intent or culpable mental state involved. Obviously, when you're talking about fraud, you've got to prove knowledge and intent. Um, you have to prove a number of other factors. So there's, there's a factual difference in the proof. So the argument that, that is made that um, these are inextricably intertwined, uh, it's our position that that doesn't really hold. There are, there are, and, in, and furthermore, there's, there are uh, different remedies involved in the fraud claim because it includes exemplary or punitive damages, attorney's fees, costs, and, and so on. So the Counsel, you're at your three-minute mark now. Okay. In, in any case, Your Honors, um, we think that the, the trial court erred in, in not finding the, pri the uh, private right of action under the regulation, and uh, we'd ask that you that and, and reverse it.
Thank you. You'll have two minutes and 51 seconds for your rebuttal. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Council. You have 15 minutes. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Jeff Weddle. May it please the Court, I'm here on behalf of Medina Hospital and Dr. Francine Terry. I think as both parties will agree, there is not a single piece of authority in the state of Ohio ever suggesting that a private cause of action exists under the administrative regulations at issue in this case. This health partnership program has been around for decades. I would have to assume there are tens of thousands, if not millions, of medical reports filed in that time span through the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And not once has there been a case suggesting a private cause of action existing under this regulatory scheme. Well, but there's no cases either way, are there? Correct. Yeah. But there's no evidence that... Maybe there's just no creative attorney yet. Your Honor, I would have to believe in my experience over the course of decades that somebody would have gotten clever. Well, I'm just saying. So there's nothing either way. Both sides agree. The long and short of this case, really, is this case rises and falls on the STRAC factors. You've got to meet all three of them in order to have a private cause of action. The trial court looked at each and every one and did a fairly thoughtful and detailed analysis of its rationale of why it did not believe that any of the three factors were met in this case. You know, if you look at the first component was the plaintiff, one of the class for whom the special benefit of the statute was enacted, there are several provisions that would suggest that an employer, a state-funded employer, is not the special beneficiary of the statute. The statute and the regulatory scheme under the statute was enacted to provide what I would refer to as almost like a mini insurance company within the Bureau of Workers' Compensation to streamline the delivery of medical treatment for injured workers, govern relationships with managed care organizations, and set rules for providers in terms of their certifications and billings for treating injured workers. But the court, to its credit, looked at it from both ways. It did not believe that the first prong was satisfied, but even to your point earlier, Judge Carr, said, okay, assuming arguendo the first element is met, let's look at the next two elements. If you look at the second element, which I believe is totally fatal to this claim, there is absolutely nothing explicitly in either the enabling statute that would suggest a private cause of action exists for any problems under the health partnership program. Second, there is nothing explicitly in any of the regulations that suggest any private causes of action exist. Well, I have a question. If, from what I understand from ATD's view, they would have had an opportunity to appeal the decision that came from the Bureau of Workers' Comp. They trusted that the documentation that came from Dr. Terry was correct, and they didn't bother to appeal it because they trusted that document to be true. So if that were the case, then they relied on some documentation that was false, and could that qualify as an implicit protection? Because they are a class, they're employers, so under the first prong, couldn't they qualify as a special benefit as a bunch of employers don't have to administer all this stuff individually, now the state can manage it for them? So wouldn't that be a benefit also, that the employers as a class could benefit under the first one? And then wouldn't it be implicit that because they're relying on the documentation of possible providing, they forewent an opportunity to appeal that? I would disagree with the factual premise from which you're operating, Judge Schaefer. And the reason I would do that is the only evidence in this case that was consistently presented by Medina General to ADT was treatment by Nurse Practitioner Kirby. When Nurse Practitioner Kirby executed the C-9, she attached her treatment notes that reflect that she is the one that rendered the treatment. So to suggest that, you know, we didn't know or we were unaware that anything happened, I believe is a completely false premise. You know, and there was a representation also made, and I'm going to assume it was inadvertent, that the Bureau of Workers' Compensation somehow made a determination that there was anything inappropriate with that C-9. They never did, because one of the things that strikes me in the course of this case, ADT comes forth with a private lawsuit years after the fact. At no time did they complain during the course of this BWC fraud investigation of a fraud committed by the employee, not Medina General, not Dr. Terry, to complain that they somehow inappropriately relied on Dr. Terry. That never happened. They never suggested at any time during the course of this BWC fraud investigation that there was anything inappropriate with what either Nurse Practitioner Kirby did 
or Dr. Terry in this. And I find it particularly telling to your point about whether they somehow can be a special beneficiary of the statute or whether there's some type of implicit to have never raised this for years until you file a lawsuit suggests otherwise, in my opinion. You know, and, and candidly, even if you look at the fraud investigator's interview of Dr. Terry, they only like to cite part of that. What Dr. Terry says is, is that I can't say definitively in response to a question from the investigator of whether it was definitive that the herniated discs were caused. What she goes on to tell the investigator is, there is a clinical correlation between the MRI findings and the symptomatology presented. And she was of the opinion that there was a relationship between the two. And as we all know, when a doctor expresses an opinion, a doctor does not have to express an opinion to a reasonable degree of definitiveness. It's a reasonable degree of probability. So if you look at all of the evidence, not just the ones put under a microscope or a rather myopic view of the factual record here, they just simply don't support the claim and give no rise to believe that there is some type of implicit cause of action in the statute. This judge, the trial judge, looked at the legislation that enabled HPP. It looked at a comprehensive view of the regulatory structure and found nothing suggestive of a private right of action. And interestingly enough, we cite two cases in our brief, the Patterson case and the Gray case. And although they didn't look at the HPP, they looked at another component of the workers' comp program. And it was 4121.44 and 4121.444. And attempts have been made to try and create a private cause of action under there. Both courts in Patterson as well as in Gray rejected that and said there is no private cause of action. The legislature under that particular legislation and the accompanying regulations gave the attorney general the right to pursue actions but no one else. And they found looking at that, there was no basis to infer or imply that there was a cause of action. The final element of the STRAC test is whether a private cause of action would be consistent with a legislative scheme to imply some form of remedy. Again, there is nothing in looking at the history of this. This is designed to affect the delivery of health care services to injured workers and to govern that realm. They have a separate cause of action for fraud currently pending in the common police court to address their concerns. There is nothing in either the legislative history which enabled the health partnership program or any of the regulatory structure to suggest that there is a private cause of action. There is simply nothing there. It's kind of funny. If you look at the provision right before in the regs, this provision, there is a code section 4123-6-20 which puts an affirmative obligation on a health care provider to submit accurate and legible reports. If you take their argument to the logical extreme, if a doctor submits illegible records, they can have a private cause of action against them for violating the preceding regulatory section. And I don't know if your honors have ever read doctor's records, but I find almost all of them to be illegible. You almost need a course in hieroglyphics to be able to figure them out. I think it would strain credibility to suggest to this court that you can infer a private cause of action because a doctor submitted illegible records. That would be absolutely ridiculous. It makes no much more sense to allow private causes of action under the regulation before this court because likewise there is no basis to infer any cause of action. Let me just touch on briefly the motion to dismiss we filed in the court certification. I will suggest to the court that we really looked at it in kind of a two-fold fashion. We looked at the facts in this case as being kind of inextricably intertwined between the alleged claim under the regulation with the fraud claim. All of the same evidence is going to come in. If you look at the regulation, it's in very lawyerly fashion. It uses eight words to describe the same basic type of conduct. So it has a fraud, a misrepresentation, a deception component, which is the same evidence that's going to be heard in trial. The second aspect is we were looking at judicial economy. That since the same evidence is going to be done, that's going to be trotted out of trial in the event the case below survives summary judgment. And that's why we filed the motion requesting that the court decline to exercise jurisdiction. Counsel, when you're talking about judicial economy, I guess one of the things that enter my mind is if 
all the facts are so inextricably intertwined. If we would reverse this, if we would take the jurisdiction and reverse it, though, uh, or if we just said there's no jurisdiction, um, and you go to trial, and obviously somebody's going to win or lose if you go to trial, mm -hmm. and then it's appealed, it could be ending up being in the position that this private cause, of, there could be a private cause of action, and you're going to have to retry that with the same facts, too. So it looks to me like there's no way of doing a judicial economy in this situation. It, it, it was a tough question, and we debated that very point that you make when deciding to file the motion to dismiss. But in looking at the language and the type of conduct that is supposedly prohibited, the nature of the proofs that we're going to go in, we found them kind of on all fours, and that's why we filed the motion. Um, I'm happy to answer any further questions from the panel. No? Uh, doesn't look like there are any, so thank you, Attorney Weddle. Thank you, Your Honor. Your, uh, Briefly, with regard to the, the assertion that automation tools, I didn't do anything for years while this was pending, they did not learn that Dr. Terry was not, in fact, a person who exercised medical judgment in checking the C9. In fact, nobody other than a nurse following protocol did. That became apparent from the SIU investigation. So. It's not like they had this information. That was in about 2011. They immediately went after the fraud claims. Now, with regard to the, the motion to dismiss, um, obviously, the court first has to look at 250502, uh, in terms of what the final order is. You have to have factually separate and independent facts, or if not, you have to have substantially different, or legal theories with substantially different facts, or facts providing for different relief. As I said, we have different relief here. We have legal theories that require substantially different facts. The, the rule talks about misleading information. It's a lower uh, standard of proof, if you will. All, all the provider has to do to, uh, to violate the rules is provide something misleading. It doesn't have to be false, fraudulent, and so forth. So it differs from fraud in that way. Um, so I, we think under 2502, in fact, these are um, you are not in the, so inextricably uh, intertwined so as to, to not be a, fi a final appealable order. I'd also just bring to the court's attention a, a, a case, um, Linda Sainer versus Elson Power Struck, 67 Ohio State, 3rd, 352, 1993, case that says different legal theories that require proof of substantially different facts may, in fact, be final orders. And, and just to conclude, and, 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 sort of in response to your comment, Judge Carr. Um, the Winter State Court notes that uh, with, with the appeal resolved one way or the other, the parties can operate from certainty and, and may, in fact, settle. Um, sometimes the most efficient result for judicial economy is no trial. Thank, Thank you. you both uh, for your arguments and presentations today. The court will also take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Of course, the court reports will mail each of you a copy of the court's decision on the day that it's released. You can also uh, look for the decision on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website. Uh, we appreciate your arguments, and the court will be adjourned at the